Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, I'm your host, Joel Burke. And thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with two congressional staffers uh, working for members, and I will introduce them consecutively. Uh, Lauren G. serves as Senior Health Policy Counsel to Senator Benjamin Cardin, a member of the Senate Finance Committee, where she handles issues related to public and private health insurance, prescription drug pricing, mental health and substance use disorders, and minority health and health disparities. During her time with Senator Cardin, Lauren has actively worked on legislation to expand dental and oral health services in Medicaid, CHIP, and Medicare. Before working for Senator Cardin, Lauren served as health counsel to Senator Richard Blumenthal, focusing on infectious diseases and antitrust laws within the health care system. Prior to that, Lauren served as legislative counsel to Senator Maisie Hirono, working for the Senate Judiciary Committee on Antitrust, Competition Policy, and Consumer Rights. Lauren grew up in Mississippi and graduated magna cum laude from Mississippi University for Women with a Bachelor of Arts in English and a minor in Spanish and a minor in Spanish and International Relations. She later earned her Juris Doctor from the University of Mississippi School of Law. Thanks for being here, Lauren. And then Jamie Neal to my left. Jamie has worked for Congressman Mike Simpson since 2013 and has handled agriculture, interior, and labor, health, and human education, human services, education appropriations. He previously worked for the former chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, Doc Hastings, from Washington. Jamie attended the University of Idaho and Washington State University and received a degree in communication advertising with an emphasis in business administration from the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication. He was a scholarship athlete for the University of Idaho men's golf team and still enjoys playing whenever he can. His grandfather practiced pediatric, practiced dentistry and owned his own practice in Edmonds, Washington. So thank you both for being here today. I'm going to start out just by asking um, how you got your job, in case somebody out here wants to get their job. How, how did you get your job, Lauren? Um, so I think when you come to the Hill, it's a lot of meet and greets, a lot of having coffees with people you've never met before and really putting yourself out there. Um, So the few things that I did was I targeted a few different offices that I was interested in working for. And I just cold called them, uh, asked them to have coffee with me, and asked if they had any jobs available or knew if anyone was looking for something. And so I had to really put myself out there, and I struck gold with Senator Hirono's office. Um, Their legislative director was, I think, impressed by my gumption. And so he's like, we need a judiciary clerk. Why don't you come and work for us? And from there, once I passed the bar, they hired on me as a counsel for their judiciary staff. That's great. And Jamie? So I, I grew up on uh, Bay Ridge Island, Washington, um, went to University of Idaho and, and Washington State University. And when I got out of college, um, I needed a job, so I decided I would do an internship on Capitol Hill. Lucky for me, one of my um, uh, teammates on the golf team, um, his mom worked in our district office uh, for, for Mike Simpson. So she put my resume on the top of the stack. I got an internship. I came back to D.C. I loved it. Mike got me a job with Doc Hastings, the former chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. And um, a couple years later, uh, I came back working for Mike, and and I've been there ever since. So um, like Lauren said, it's a lot of meet and greets, a lot of coffees. You know, it's it's relationship building is, is I think, the main asset in this job. So that's really what brought me here and and kept me here. So coffee is a big part of the job. You can Mm -hmm. drink coffee, I see. Yes, yes. So speaking of that, on a typical day... Is, if there is such a thing, when do you arrive, when you leave? You hear these stories. I think the former uh, Speaker of the House bragged about living in his office, I believe. Yes. So do you live in your office, Lauren? I don't currently. Uh, there, are definitely <laughs> times, there are definitely times in the year where I may come in uh, probably pretty early. I'd say 8 to 8.30, and I won't leave till. 9 or 10. Um, right now, we're kind of in a lull. I probably come in at about 8.30 and leave at 7. Uh, it's just depending on the amount of work that I have to do. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. Uh, my boss is a pretty laid-back guy. So if the weather's above 60 or 70 degrees, he usually comes in the back and says, why don't you go play golf today? 
Um, I was going to ask you if that happened, but you just yeah, y- yeah, yeah. So I'm going to out myself, but um, no, but 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 there are days where you work super hard. You get there at seven. Um, right now is one of those times. My boss is on the appropriations committee, so this is the time of year when we have all the fly-ins. We take all the appropriations requests. You know, obviously the dental faculty loan repayment program being one of those hugely important to my boss. Have to put a plug in for that, of course. But these are the times of year when you get there at seven. Um, you leave at nine or ten. I mean, I've been here at every hour of the day. So it's uh, it just kind of depends, but it makes up for it when you do get to go leave at three o'clock and play golf. So that's nice. So I just want to follow up on some of the things that were mentioned earlier in the previous part of the program, and maybe we'll just take Francisco's uh, comments from a moment ago about uh, getting more faculty. And let's say that he were interested, uh, along with others here, in getting more faculty to want to come to academics and be a pediatric dental faculty member. And they didn't even know how to go about legislation. Are there, is, are there ways to kind of help people formulate the actual legislation that might eventually result from these meetings? Does that make sense, my question? How do you, how do you, I mean, most people, don't, we don't even know the process. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Lauren. Sure. So I think um, I'm really lucky. I'm, I'm representing the state of Maryland. I'm our bosses. And so I interact with a lot of those constituents in Maryland. They're very engaged. They're very well informed. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, people just want to have their voice heard. And so they can come to the office, they can talk to us about a problem that they're having um, with it, either with themselves or their family member. And from there, as a staffer, I'm able to make the connection like, oh, maybe we could do this policy or maybe we could do it this way to address the problem that you're having with your, your health issue or something like that. Um, you know, sometimes constituents can be part of a larger group, like the group here, and those those groups have larger expertise, or, um, you know, lawyers or someone who could draft the legislation for them. But really just getting in front of the staffer, I would say, is the most important part. I want to, I want to follow on that because um, you were mentioning to me a few minutes ago that you have about 10 or 12 meetings set up tomorrow, I believe. Was that, was that right? And then we're, we're descending on Capitol Hill, uh, large numbers of people about our issue. And in the scheme of things, and uh, chime in Jamie as well, how does, you know, does, do our issues get risen up to the top? And how, how do we get our issue in the midst of all the things going on from all these different perspectives and constituents? You're the one that makes our issue survive and get to the top and get accomplished. Is that right? Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I'm very lucky. I work for a dentist, so you don't have to convince us that your issues are important. I'm just sort of tasked with saying whatever, uh, you know, the ADA or you guys come in and ask us to do, that's important. And my boss, he's a former ADA member. He understands what you guys are doing. And I think it's most important to meet with staff because at the end of the day, we're the folks that then take this to the committee hearings, to the, you know, to other legislators asking for co-sponsors and so forth. So uh, if you don't get a meet with the member of Congress, just know that it, you're still important and you're still valued in that aspect and perhaps more important. Do you want to comment on that too, Lauren? Sure. I'd say the most important thing for me is when folks come in with a, with a personal story, something that can really engage me on the issue, to show me what's happening on the ground or what's happened in their personal experience that relates to the policy change that's needed. And then I'm able to take that story to my boss and really convince him, this is why we need to do this. People are suffering. This is going wrong. We have to do something to make this change. And the fact that we're representing our districts specifically, I imagine, is, is even more important. That so we're coming with a story from the district that you represent, from the state that you represent, from the district you represent. I imagine that makes a big difference. Oh, it's- Most definitely makes a big difference. I think my boss has really been engaged on pediatric dental since DeMonte Driver. And he was a mm-hmm. young uh, child in Maryland, 12 years old, who had a tooth abscess that later caused an infection that went to his brain. And, that happened in his district. And that that's happened right. in his district. And that's something that he's been engaged on ever since. And so anything that we can do to improve pediatric dental and access to those services in Maryland is in, in the nation, really, is something that he's been really engaged on. Is there homework you have to do, Jamie, to prep for us when we we're coming to see you in large numbers, even though uh, you work for a dentist? Sure. Uh, do you have to do some homework in advance to kind sure. of be I prepared? To, I have to do homework uh, when I even talk to my own boss. I mean, he's smarter than I am because he was a dentist. Um, but I, I'm pretty fortunate, and um, I've had a chance to meet with Hebrew over the years, um, with Dr. Brill coming in, and, you know, there's a lot of legwork that goes in ahead of time of them coming to see me and explaining the issue, making sure I'm well-read on it before you guys get here so we can engage in a, in a thoughtful discussion. So, you know, I would say the homework is all done kind of ahead of time. 
And then when you guys are here, you just further that with your, your personal stories, as Lauren uh, alluded to. Sure. I switch between issues quite often. And so if sometimes I just need someone to come in and engage with me and say, this is the issue that we're talking about now. And then I can switch my brain there because I've done my homework, but I just need like a few buzzwords. Once I have those buzzwords, so you're saying I we can get going. So you do that for you? Yes. If you could give me a few buzzwords, pediatric dental, dental faculty loan program, gotcha. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I understand to help you focus on what our issue is to get you ready for us, so to speak, as we mm-hmm. come to meet you. That's, mm-hmm. that's a good help for us. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing, offering pediatric restorative solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, visit www.hughfreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. So what percentage of your time, uh, Jamie and Lauren, is spent uh, meeting with constituents and lobbyists like us? Or We're not lobbyists, we're constituents. Uh, what percentage of your time is, is focused on that versus other things? And what are those other things that you do? Sure. So I'd say about 75% of my time is meeting with constituents. Um, there are lobbyists that come into the office. Um, you know, those are the, the experts that help connect us with, with constituents. And then the other things we do, the 25%, you know, it's, it's looking at the constituent correspondence, the folks that um, don't have the luxury to travel back to, to D.C., which is pretty common, um, especially when you represent a state like Idaho. Um, it's a long way. It's not as easy as to, to get from, from Maryland. You know, and a lot of it's doing homework, researching the policy issues that you guys are talking about, figuring out what's going on across the country and not just in Idaho, because oftentimes we do get particular or specific Idaho stories. And then, of course, talking to my boss and engaging with him and say, what are your questions? What do you want to know? And then also hearing prep. You know, that's a huge part of it as well. My boss is going in front of cabinet members, and he wants to know what questions he might get, what you might anticipate. You mean all those things they say? Not them? Uh, yes. Not all of <laughs> she them? She says yes. <laughs> Some of them. Lauren's, Lauren's a yes. <laughs> we'll remember that next time. Lauren's smarter than I am, so she, her oh, boss yeah. should read that. I would say my <laughs> boss makes me look really good. Sometimes he's, he just look, he's so smart and so intelligent. I'm like, oh, I hope they think I did that work, but he really did it. <laughs> okay. Well, that's helpful. So going back to some of the things you both have said, we want to be effective advocates, all of us, as we, we have a limited time, and you said, you know, give an intro. What are some of the other things you'd recommend to make us more effective as an advocate for what we're so passionate about? What can we do better uh, to enhance that 10 or 15 minutes that we have of your time? I think, you know, again, going back to the personal stories, going back to maybe your patients, going back to experience you've had in your practice, that's really, the, really important and really gets me understanding what the crux of the issue is. Yeah, I, I think having a, a personal story is important. You know, explaining the issue in a, in a concise way because we do only have 10 or 15 minutes, but in a way that, that staff will remember because, as, as Lauren alluded to, she's got 12 meetings tomorrow, um, and, and she's got to learn something from each of those 12 meetings. So keeping those buzzwords, keeping it concise, um, but also having that personal story is, is, you know, kind of, it's really important. So about, about getting involved, you know, all of us come from our districts. We're here to represent our districts. We're also representing the cause of the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. But we want to get involved not only this few days a year that we're here, and it gets bigger each year in terms of our numbers, but what can we do locally, you know, for, for those of us who want to get involved locally throughout the year? Um, we always hear about members not spending time in their district or going back to their district. Well, we're constituents, and we are in our district. What can we do locally to get involved and from an advocacy perspective? Sure. So um, a lot of people don't realize that, that we've got district offices um, spread out or, or state offices in the senator's case. Um, where you can meet with staff, and that you don't have to travel all the way back to D.C. to meet, and, and those staff are just as important as, as me or Lauren. Um, you know, sometimes I'm fortunate enough to travel out to Idaho and meet directly with those folks, but what I would say is set up a meeting or two throughout the year with our district staff. We've got four or five district offices throughout, um, throughout Idaho, which is, is, you know, pretty large because my boss has a large geographic area. But go engage and, and meet with other staff. Meet with the senator's staff. Meet with uh, your local representatives as well. And, and don't feel like this is your only opportunity to advocate. 
And the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to reach out. You know, I give out my card that has my email address, that has our office phone number. Feel free to engage with me. Feel free to reach out to email me. It may take me a day or two to respond, but I definitely will respond. And when people reach out to me, the more and more about one particular issue, especially that's something so important to them, the more likely I am to be like, okay, I had that bill, I was drafting it, but I put it aside. Now I'm engaging with someone again. They really want this. Let me get back on track to make sure I'm doing what they are wanting me to do. That's great. Can, can you, I mean, given what we said, we're talking about you know, a large number of us uh, descending on Capitol Hill, talking to you, talking to all of our representatives. Can you imagine an idea from us actually making it, making it to legislation, and how would that occur? I know that's a tough question, a long question or a long answer, but... Can you imagine an idea from us actually making it to legislation? Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think that there's an example right now, and we're talking about um, you know making the faculty loan repayments tax exempt. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's a factor of you guys talking to us. I think that's us listening. I think that's Dr. Brill. That's Heber um, listening as well, and and then all of us formulating a strategy together. So, just because it doesn't directly come from the constituent to my boss doesn't mean there's not a lot of intermediary factors that have helped. I think of us as a team at that point, um, and that's our best chance to be successful and, and get something signed into law. So, you know, on that particular policy, I'm hopeful this year and hopefully it makes it to the president's desk. But if not, you know, we'll, we'll keep trying and, and, and uh, see what we can do. Otherwise, we'll have 500 next year telling you <laughs> to do that or more. Yes. Lauren, anything from you on that? Sure. I just think the best ideas generally come from constituents because they're the ones who are in the community who are seeing what's happening. Um, I've had an, a bill that I worked on for the substance use for substance use disorder for the opioid package came from a constituent, and we were able to get uh, a, bill, a version of their idea into the opioid package. So it really happens more often than I think people realize. Um, I think you just kind of have to have the courage to be able to step in front of your legislature and ask them for what you want. Now, we talked about things that we should do when we come see you as an advocate, are there things that we shouldn't do? Are there things that we should avoid doing in terms of behaviors or (laughs) words spoken uh, that you can think of that you'd be willing to share with us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, staying on the topic of dentistry, staying on the topics that you guys are, are talking about today, you guys truly are the experts. So take your 10, 15, 30 minutes, whatever it is, to talk about what you know. Um, and, you know, if we get a little off topic, there's a good chance that we won't even know what's talking about. If someone were to come in and, and ask me about trade policy, I might just kind of look at you with blank eyes because that's not my area of expertise. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's an effective use of anyone's time. So, you know, talk about what you guys know because you guys really are a hugely valuable resource and asset to us. And, and let's make, you know, take advantage of this time. The one other thing I would say is that a lot of folks on Capitol Hill are are fairly young. So you could be meeting with someone who's 20 to, you know, 32 or so. Um, so don't get discouraged if you're meeting with a younger staffer. They are just as engaged and willing to help you as someone who is more of a subject matter expertise in the office. It's, it's just, you know, some, I, don't, I don't get mistaken for an intern anymore, but I used to. And so it'd be sometimes frustrating if people didn't take my engagement with them seriously. So I just yeah. want to make sure that y'all know that we're very serious. Um, even the folks who are young, they're very serious, and they want to be able to help y'all. That, that's fantastic. So um, any other advice about the actual meeting? And I think one thing I wanted to ask you specifically in terms of how we should handle ourselves, we come in in groups sometimes, especially if you're from California. There's probably going to be like 70 people. No. <laughs> in some of the meetings, not that many, but there'll be a large group. <laughs> And would you advise us to have one person do all the talking, or would you, would you prefer when we go around the room and each person says this and the next person says a bullet point, which is better for you, generally speaking? I, I think it's important that everyone speaks because um, everyone's got a story. Um, but I would say uh, allow the constituents in the room to have their time with their member, with the member staff. I think that's most important because that's you know, how the process is set up. So you know, if you're from Idaho and you're in my office, Talk my ear off. I I look forward to it. Um, uh, But if you're in other offices, maybe give the Californians a chance to to speak and so forth. Great. No, I would just say um, I've I've seen it done many different ways. I think as, you know, as long as you're getting your point across, I I like when everyone does an introduction so I can know where they are from the state. Mm -hmm. So that's how I generally like to start off my meetings. And then, you know, hey, what do you want to talk about today? I'm here for you. Great. I think we're, we're ready. We're ready for you. So thank you so much to both of you. 
for uh, taking your time to come talk to us today. And, really and appreciate it. Trust me when I say we're much more scared of you guys than you are of us. Because um, you guys are the bosses, you're the voters. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> And thank you for tuning into Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. We'll see you here next time. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.